Hi friends, I'm Lisa and this is Small Kids Big God and today we're going to talk about how to answer our kids' tough questions about faith. So oftentimes our kids will ask us just really remarkably difficult questions about the Bible or theology or God or something we never even considered before and they're throwing these questions at us usually at a time that we're not expecting like bedtime or when we're rushing out the door or something like that and how do we answer these questions and what about kids that are struggling in their faith and they're asking us questions that we're not sure about the answer to and but we want to make sure we respond well well that's what I'm going to talk about today we're going to answer learn how to answer kids questions about faith and um, give you some principles for how we can deal with questions in general so my oldest kid is only eight, but trust me, we've had lots of difficult questions in our household already. It's amazing the questions that three, four, five-year-olds will come up with. And I've also had um, friends pose their kids' questions to me. I had a friend that we went to seminary together and graduated together, and she came to me because her five-year-old had a question that she wanted to discuss with me before figuring out the answer. And it was a, it was a challenging question. I've had kids in Sunday school, Older kids ask difficult questions. Kids who are learning about God and faith naturally ask questions, and that's great, but we, how do we respond to them? How do we find the answers? What should we do? Here are some of the questions I've heard from really young kids. How can these two parts of the Bible be, both be true? Aren't these pieces of the Bible in conflict? How can the Bible be true? It's been copied thousands of times. Why did Jesus only go to hell one day if the person who is um, being punished for their sin has to go to hell for eternity? Yeah, that was a five-year-old question. Where is so-and-so now that they've died? Why did God allow this bad thing to happen? How did Satan have the power to create the windstorm in the book of Job? And many more questions. Those are just a couple I thought of off the top of my head. So first, let's take a step back and think about general truths about questions of faith. I'm looking down at my notes. If you see me looking down, I've got my notes on my lap. First of all, it's a good thing that our kids are asking questions. We want our kids to be seeking God, to be to care about God, the Bible, etc. So when they're asking questions, they're showing that they care. Um, both our kids who have been saved or kids who are not yet saved, we want them to seek God. So all these questions are good. Encourage questions. When, they, when your kid asks you a question, respond that you're glad they're asking a question. Never try to shut down a question or tell them to just, you know, deal with it or just forget about it. Questions are always good. What we think about God affects what we think about everything else. And so it's important that our theology is correct and that our kids are thinking through that. And this is so good that they're asking questions. It shows that they want to grow in faith. We don't want kids to just um, be apathetic about God, to not even care about God or the Bible, or to just accept everything we tell them without actually making it personal for themselves and just saying, oh, yes, yes, like a head nodding kind of thing. And Beth Moore's Bible study called The Quest which is one of my favorite Bible studies ever. She really delves into the questions of the Bible and she estimates that there are around 3,300 questions in the Bible. So questions are not something to shy away from. They're naturally a part of faith and even God asks us questions as well. Secondly, we should be glad that they're asking us questions. I mean, maybe you might not feel like it at the time that you're glad they're asking us questions, but every time a child or a person asks us a question about faith, they're giving us a window into their heart. We get to see what they've been thinking about, what they've been wondering, maybe where their worries are or their doubts are or where their God is growing them. And the fact that they're asking us is a wonderful thing. So always be glad and thankful to your kids that they're asking you the question. We don't want them to necessarily just ask a peer or a friend all the time or just Google something and never share with us. It's a blessing to be asked, even at bedtime or inconvenient times, which is typically when the kids are asking these deep questions. Okay, another general idea is that not all questions about God and faith can be answered or need to be answered. We cannot master God, nor do we want to. The mystery about God is something that keeps us pursuing him. 
And of course, Psalm 145, 3 says, his greatness no one can fathom. So there will be questions that will be unanswerable, and that's okay. Beth Moore says in her Bible study that what we want even more than answers is revelation. Really, we're just seeking to know God more. Most of these questions, the underlying principle is that we, we want to know more about God. Why did he do this? Why did he not do that? What will he do in the future? We want to know him more. So it's more about God and knowing him than necessarily the answer to that specific question. And of course, it's much more important to know who God is than to try to figure out what he'll do or what he did. We want to find security in God's identity rather than in his predictability. That's from Beth Moore's um, Quest Bible Study as well. I'm telling you, it's a, it's, it's a really great study. So we want to find security in his identity rather than in God's predictability. We're not going to know everything about him. We're not going to know everything he's going to do or why he did everything he does. But we want to know God's identity. And that's going to give us a lot more information than oftentimes we recognize. Okay, another principle about questions. God is not scared of our questions or our kids' questions. He's not intimidated by our questions. He's not upset by our questions. God is truth. God is good. God is perfect. And so we will never find an answer that will pull us away from God. If you find out more about me, you might like me more, or you might find out something that will actually make you like me less. But that never happens with God. The more we know about God, the more we'll love him because he's perfect. We're just going to find more perfection, more that is worthy and that is more, um, more worthy to be glorified, worthy to be loved. So seeking more about God always brings blessing and um, it's always a good thing. When we come at God with a humility, when we're asking our questions, he's always there to receive it. It's only when, only in scripture do you ever see um, Jesus reject questions when people are coming at it to trick him or like out of pride. They're not really seeking to know God or to know the answer. They're just trying to like spin it um, to make him look bad. But otherwise, God is open to questions. Okay, and then what about asking questions when we're despairing about something, like in the midst of a situation? Something sad happens, something tragic, something unjust happens, and we've got questions related to our life situation. How do we handle that? Um, N.T. Wright has a great quote that I'll read to you. He says, run off to meet Jesus. Tell him the problem. Ask him why he didn't come sooner, why he allowed that awful thing to happen, and then be prepared for a surprising response. I can't predict what the response will be for the very good reason that it is always, always a surprise. But I do know the shape it will take. Jesus will meet your problem with some new part of God's future that can and will burst into your present time, into mess and grief with good news, with hope and with new possibilities. And I know a lot of times these can be the hardest questions our kids ask when it's something that's really personal. Why did this happen to my friend, to my grandmother, to, you know, in the world, in our community? Um, or where was God in this? Or how, you know, how could God allow this to happen? It's something very personal. Or even why did God let this happen to me? Um, again, don't shy away from asking God or going to God in those situations. I know I can vouch for myself that God often responds with something surprising back, but never be afraid to pursue him and to seek him even in the midst of pain. Okay, so now let's get more specific and talk about specific questions our kids are asking and how we can give them a response. So if we don't know the answer to a question, we don't need to pretend that we do. It's okay to not know the answers to questions. And in fact, we want our kids to know that because we don't want them to think that they're a failure as a Christian if they don't know everything about God. They never will. And you can share that. You can say, I don't know that answer. That is such a good question. I will have to think about that or I will have to look that up. Another great response, if it's a time when you just like can't answer that question, then do make sure that you come back to the child and say, you know what? I was thinking about what you said yesterday and I was praying about that question and here's the answer I came up with, make sure that you come back to them in a reasonable amount of time to show them that you care about that question and that you are somebody who they can ask. 
Okay, another thing we can do is we can show our child how to seek an answer. And maybe you know the answer, or maybe you don't. But either way, we can always model for them how to find an answer. Whenever we have a question about God or scripture, which we will through our whole lives, show them how to find the answer. So we can find an answer to a question about God by praying, by searching the Bible first, and then we can go to a reliable commentary or um, a Bible dictionary. Um, we can look at a reliable theological article. You could talk to a pastor, but make sure your child knows how to find an answer and make sure that they're going to the Bible first. We can always pray about it because God says he will give us wisdom. He doesn't say, I will answer every question. But when we are seeking God, he is often um, there with answers. Always go to the Bible first and you can show them how they might find something. Um, if they're looking up a specific question where you could use a concordance or a Bible dictionary or something like that, help them to search inside the Bible. Um, and then you can show them even how to use a commentary. Maybe it's a historical question and we can look up what, what, what was like, what was that city like at that time and things like that where it might be useful to have another resource. Um, and show them where to search. Um, I often use... I use a lot of the things I have at home, Bibles, commentaries, uh, Bible dictionaries, stuff like that. I've got some theological books I look at. I also can search Bible.org if I have something really specific because there are papers there by um, theologians that often are on like really specific topics. And so that's a useful resource that I use too. Show your kids what to do and this will be a lifelong skill. Okay, another idea. Begin with what you know. When you're trying to figure out the answer to a question about God or the Bible, you can always start with what you know to be true. So we were reading the book of Job and one of the questions, I think my child was, he was, I think he was five at the time when he asked this question, but basically um, it says that Satan sent a whirlwind to Job to like, you know, to destroy his property. And so his question was, how does Satan have the power over the weather to destroy things, right? I didn't know Satan could make whirlwinds. Really good question. So when I'm thinking about the answer, we can have to think about what we know to be true. So in this instance, we know God is all powerful. Satan is not. God created the world. God has authority over nature. Satan does not. Okay. So all those things are true, but Satan was allowed to create a whirlwind. So how did he get that power? He must have been given that power by God or allowed to use this power by God. Um, basically, we know that Satan doesn't have control over the weather unless God were to allow him to. And so that must be our answer. Like we can deduce that from the truth that we know. Oftentimes this gets us really close to an answer or it can be satisfying for an unanswerable question. When we go through all the truths that we do know, we find out we know a lot more than we thought. And it can be really helpful even if we can't pinpoint a specific answer for a specific question. So begin with what you know. Okay, what about the unanswerable questions? Some questions we won't know an answer to in this lifetime. Why did God allow so-and-so to die? Why did God heal this person or not this person? Um, I don't, we don't need to suggest that we have the answer to that, um, but we, can't, we can do more than just kind of dismiss the question. Again, kind of talk about what we know. Why did God allow this tragic thing to happen? We don't know exactly why God allowed this specific tragedy to happen, but we know certain things. We know God is good. We know God is all-powerful. We know God is perfect. We know God is loving. Um, we know that God cares, that God, um, that Jesus wept when his friends wept over tragedy. So there's a lot of comfort that that brings, that even though we may not know this answer in our lifetime. There is a lot that we do know about God that can bring us peace even in difficult times. Okay, what about questions from children who don't believe or children who are kind of cynical or struggling in faith, um, kids who are not yet Christians, how do we deal with their doubts, or the questions that seem to us like doubts or even like attacks on the faith? On the faith? Here's my recommendation. Encourage them to keep on seeking. Send them back to God's word. Always send them back here. Tell them, ask God, ask God, ask God. Look in the Bible. Don't be scared. 
to send them to God and to the Bible. They're not going to find anything in here that was like a surprise or that God didn't intend that is going to, you know, trip them up. Keep sending them back. Tell them to keep seeking, to keep asking God. God will reveal himself to them. Um, if they want to know about God or the Christianity, they need to go to the source. Other books and resources can be helpful, but keep sending them back to God's word. And of course, because the Bible was written by the Holy Spirit and it can be illuminated by him, there's nothing else like it. There's a quote I'm going to read from Eugene Peterson in his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, which I recommend. And he talks about the kind of cynicism in our hearts. And here's what he says about it. Don't hesitate to put the psalm or any other scripture passage under the searchlight of your disbelief. The reason many of us do not ardently believe in the gospel is that we've never given it a rigorous testing, thrown our hard questions at it, faced it with our most prickly doubts. Again, because we know that God is perfect and true and loving and good, we don't need to be scared to delve deeper into these questions. Um, I, even with a cynical heart, if it's seeking God, God can soften that heart and you can pray for your child, of course, and, but keep directing them to the Bible and just encouraging them to seek and be glad that they're asking questions and they're not just apathetic and totally hard hearted and turned off. Okay. Another tactic we can use for questions is we can ask them something back. We can ask them a question back. This can help us get to the heart of the child or encourage them to take their faith into their own hands. So sometimes kids ask questions that maybe they could probably think of the answer to themselves, or maybe we just want to kind of grow them or even search inside their heart a little bit more. We can ask them questions back. Why do you think God allowed that to happen? Or, well, what has God promised us about that? And these questions will get more to the heart of what your child is thinking about and kind of get them to engage more with their own question and with you. Okay, and then the final type of question I wanted to talk about is what about questions where there seems to be a kind of conflict with the Bible? Like your child is reading a science book or watched um, a medical video and it seems to be conflicting with what the Bible says and now they're saying, wait, how can this be true when the Bible says this but the video says this? Um, oftentimes I feel like people are scared of those questions. We don't need to be scared because the Bible is true and God is true and so anything that is in disagreement with that is either wrong or our understanding of scripture is wrong. So um, we need to start with knowing that the Bible is true and that God created all natural things. Everything living, everything scientific, he created our bodies, so anything like medical or you know of creation of the earth, the solar system, is God's. It's his first, okay? So um, our understanding of the Bible is not always correct so sometimes it doesn't jive with science because we're misunderstanding the Bible um, sometimes science is wrong our natural studies kind of other things like that one thing to remember about science specifically is that it's it's a study of natural things it's not a study of the supernatural so anything that is God is outside the bounds of science and so of course science can't like prove God or um, can't put God in that box. That's not even its subject area. But I do know there's some things that we've come across that seem to be in conflict with what um, the Bible says. And so how do we answer these questions when we're teaching our kids? A couple things to know. God is not bound by science, medicine, or even logic. It doesn't have to be make sense or be provable that Mary was a pregnant virgin or Lazarus was raised from the dead. That doesn't, in order for those things to be true, they don't have to be provable or fit within a box, even of logic. Like God is not bound by time or space, so he doesn't have to be bound by these constraints that we put on ourselves. Um, God is bigger than our common sense. God is bigger than our limitations. Um, I would say go back to what you know to be true about scripture and then hold, ask God to show you um, and to be able to hold loosely um, both what you've learned about science and kind of like your your understanding as you've known it before in scripture. So like in our house, we talked a lot about dinosaurs. Like when did dinosaurs exist? Did they exist at the time of man or not? Because if you read scripture, um, it looks like land animals were created when humans were created so that they would have existed at the same time. 
Most scientists don't say that that's true. They believe that dinosaurs existed and then died out way before man was created. So it's not like, oh no, what happened? Like the Bible must be wrong or all these people talking about dinosaurs must be completely off. I mean, there are other ways to try and to reconcile those two things, but that's not something that ever needs to be scary. Um, for our kids, we, it's kind of like a good brainstorming opportunity. Okay, here's what we think the Bible says, or here's what we know the Bible says. Here's what we think it means. And then here's what some scientists are saying and where are they getting this information and kind of how does it go together. Um, and if it doesn't, we don't need to worry about it. It's not like God is on trial or that God will fail in any way if we can't figure out a way to reconcile um, our scientific data with what the Bible says. So I would say just sticking with what you know and um, feeling like you don't need to defend God or the Bible um, you can't. It's defensible in and of itself. It's God can take care of himself. So you don't need to worry about questions or even like seeming conflicts. Um, I would go to Jeremiah 33 when you're thinking about questions about God. It says, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. So in summary, it's a blessing and a wonderful thing when our kids ask us questions about God even when it's at the worst time, and we can respond to it well and um, at least do our best to kind of show them how we go about getting an answer from God and to never be afraid to ask God because he's perfect and he's loving and he's true. Thank you for watching. See you next time.